Hi everybody, Eric Prospero here with the Microlearning Lab. Today I'm here with Megan Torrance, and today we're gonna to be talking about our book, Data Analytics for Instructional Designers. Megan, how are you today? I am doing fantastic, how about you? I'm doing all right. I definitely appreciate the time, and normally I have the chance to read through this book. However, this is actually going to be launching soon in April, correct? Yes, April 11th. Excellent, so we'll be ready, we're gonna post this, and the first question I have is actually tied to your background. Can you walk us through your experience, who you are, your organization, and then we can jump into the specifics with the book? Sure thing. I'm the founder and CEO at Torrance Learning. We're about a 20-year-old company, uh, and we're a full-stack learning. Um, we, we, we call it direction, design, development, and data. So really supporting organizations, mostly in the corporate learning space, um, around a, a full suite of services around learning design. Wonderful. Now, for data analytics for instructional designers, can you explain the key concepts and foundational principles covered? Sure thing. So what we're really looking at is not teaching people to be data scientists, um, but starting from this position of being an instructional designer, what do you need to know in order to use data in your work? Um, and so we talk everything from um, some, some, some core definitional concepts, um, some basic statistics, not a lot of math, but some basic statistics, and then a process for going through and creating a plan, identifying questions and hypotheses, creating data sources, storing that data, analyzing it, and communicating it. And ideally that comes full circle back to making a plan to do your next analysis. So that's really the, the concept behind it is giving instructional designers enough tools to get started on their own and to engage more deeply if they're on a larger team that has a data scientist or a data support team um, to, to be able to engage meaningfully with that team. Perfect. So you don't necessarily have to have a, an advanced statistics background to, to jump okay. into this book. It's really for the instructional designer who's really trying to understand uh, high level principles tied to data analysis to, to provide more meaningful work, right? Absolutely, absolutely. It's really a matter of, of, of upping your game, right? You're a great instructional designer, where do you go next? Well, bringing data into that picture. Perfect, which ties into this next question. Can you share examples of how data has been effectively used in instructional design? So there are tons of examples, um, some and, and lots of cool things going on. Um, and the book actually has about 20 sidebar interviews and case studies with different professionals uh, from around the planet doing different kinds of work. So there's lots of stories in there. Um, there's one story that's really interesting. We have a client that um, is rolling out a new um, seller facing app. It's a mobile app. Um, part of the app includes a learning function. And so it's a mini, um, you know, learning experience platform within this app. And the app has um, nudges for different behaviors that the sellers would be taking as they go about in the world. And some of those nudges have to do with learning. So the learning team came to us and wanted to help us craft a strategy for both their learning nudges but also measuring whether or not their learning nudges were working. And so part of that is actually around the data and analytics. So we started with a process for them and, and they, we, we followed with them the same process we, we share in the book, right? So we identified a whole bunch of questions and we sorted them, and this was fantastic. We sorted them into uh, questions that the seller might have that could be answered with their own data, right? Where, am I on track? Um, what behaviors do I do that improve my results? How many and how much of things have I done? Right? We had a bunch of questions that the, the business cared about. If people learn more, does that help them sell more? Or if people spend too much time learning, are they not spending enough time selling? Which pieces of learning help sell better than others, right? And, and really the, the, the business cared about that, right? And then the learning team had a deeper level of question. They wanted to know what about certain pieces of learning content bring people back for more learning content and questions like that. 
uh, that were more granular than what the business was interested in, but really important for feeding back into learning design. Because wouldn't it be great to know what works and what doesn't so you could do more of what works, right? Um, and so that was really their, their goal. And we follow them through a, a, a process of identifying all those questions um, and then identifying what data can they actually get their hands on. There's a huge chunk of data in the app that wasn't going to be easy for them to get their hands on. And so when we looked at what their plan for analysis was, they really needed to focus on the, the kinds of things that were going to be tangible and reachable in the learning part of the app because that's what they could control. They could get that data. You didn't have to ask for permission for that data from any other parts of the organization. And they could then use that to say, see what we can do in our part of the data. We'd love to have access to the rest of the data so we can get more meaningful results. Um, and that, that client is actually still in the process of, of rolling that out, but they're going to be using that data to inform how they construct their nudges and how they construct their learning objects in the first place. It's fascinating. It's always exciting when a client has the potential to create or build in those features into an app where they can pull that information. I know a lot of our marketing clients, or sorry, our clients with external audiences uh -huh. that are tracking information either through a website or a platform. It's fantastic because you can see their behaviors. So there's a, a trackable system. Um, and any anytime that there's marketing analytics involved, you know that there's a lot of information available. So that's exciting just because you have the the content available, you have the information available. I know that's that's actually a big challenge in terms of how are we tracking this? And so can you discuss some challenges or other barriers instructional designers may have when working with data or and how they can overcome them as well? That is such a, a, a fantastic question and actually, um, one of my favorite parts of the book is at the end of every chapter, there's a little section that says, what could possibly go wrong? And we look at like all the barriers and the challenges and the mistakes to avoid, right? Um, so it's just, there's a few things, right? There's the, the, the barrier to even getting started. Um, sometimes this feels scary. It's something that we're not, um, you know, instructional designers don't often have access to a whole lot of data. Um, we get what comes out of our learning management system and many instructional designers aren't even able to use that really well right um and so just that 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 getting over the hump of getting started that own internal barrier um there's then a barrier around what do the systems that you have and that you have access to as an instructional designer what can you get from them so most instructional designers are working in an environment in which we use a lot of scorm to uh, for our e-learning to communicate with our learning management systems. And SCORM is great because it's everywhere, but SCORM is super limited. So we've got this very limited data set that we can work with, right? Um, and so that's a barrier. It's just getting over the hump and getting into better data. And whether that's XAPI, whether that is detailed video analysis, whether that is, um, you know, on the business side and the, re the results of the learning, whether that's better data from um, point of sale systems, ERPs, manufacturing systems, um, CRMs, right? All the tools in which where, a per, where the, the results of what a person's work is, is stored. And that's a valuable source of information if we can get to it. Uh, and then the next challenge is connecting all that data so it talks to each other, right? So if I've got a bunch of data, and that's great, and it's in my learning system, and I've got a bunch of data in my marketing system, and I've got a bunch of data in my video system, and I've got a mobile coaching tool or something, and I got a bunch of data there. We got all these learning and performance tools. And if none of them are talking to each other, that makes an analytics very difficult. I, I can do siloed analytics, but people don't work in silos. I, and people work across by topic. They work by sales, by leadership, by safety, right? So those are the kinds of things that um, the challenges that people tend to overcome. Um, those are process challenges. The nuts and bolts challenges, a lot of instructional designers don't know where to start. That's why the book is here, right? That's that's probably the easiest and cheapest solution in the, uh, of the lock. Um, their tools don't support it. They don't have um, time in their day to learn or start or do something new. They don't sometimes get um, business leader support or somebody saying, yeah, I actually want you to bring me better data. 
And so they have to build that business case in order to get the resources and the attention and the time in order to do it. Yeah, that makes sense. A lot of times there there's pressure from the top as to, hey, we, we just need this done, right? Yeah. Uh, but without the data, you can't validate why you need it done. But I definitely like the approach of organizing all those transaction points and then pulling them together. Because uh, again, it's, it's very difficult to track behavior changes after, but I, I'm sure it's very easy to really figure out, all right, what are lead met- metrics we can track on the learning management system and lag metrics that we can see either through behavior or certain transactions or tied to the results we're expecting. Yeah, or at the very least survey people and ask. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's, there's lots of ways. Love it. Now, what advice would you give to an instructional designer who's just starting to work with data and analytics? I think my biggest advice is to start small. Um, and I, I, I joke, I used to be the person who wanted all the data on all the things. I figured there'd be some piece of gold in there somewhere and I want all of it. And I would worry that if I didn't track it all, I might never get access to it. Uh, and yet that can also be very overwhelming and very difficult to manage. Um, A lot of instructional designers have tools already that capture data, and some of them capture rich data. Um, There are free sample learning record stores with great analytics um, uh, sample platforms, right? You get a free trial. So you can actually go out now, start playing around with what kinds of data your courses could send. Just flip the switch over to publish to XAPI, right? And if you're in an e-learning space um, or find other tools, right, that are publishing with rich data and then start digging in and get really comfortable with the reporting function, um, get really comfortable with exporting to Excel or CSV and play around in Excel. It's a lot you can do in Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets that gets you a lot of the way toward basic analytics without costing any more money than what you're already spending to have those tools on your laptop. Uh, With this book offering, where could we find more information about you as well as uh, your new book? So new book is on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all your favorite uh, big book sellers. Um, And uh, it's an ATD press book. So if you go to an ATD conference um, or a conference that has an ATD bookstore, you'll see it there also. my home base is at torrenslearning.com, so that's a great place to come and see what we're doing. And uh, I'm a big LinkedIn user, so people can, I would love for people to reach out, connect with me on LinkedIn, share with me what, uh, what you're working on and what you're interested in. That's a great place to get in touch with me. Awesome. Megan, thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate it, and I'm excited to share this book information. Thanks, Eric. This was awesome. Cheers. If you want to continue learning about microlearning best practices, be sure to subscribe to our channel, The Microlearning Lab by Ninjatropic. We'll keep sharing the latest tips, tricks, and techniques to help you get the most out of your training programs.